Ready, set, go. Welcome to the, what is it, July 31st meeting of the OSE developer team. A few updates on my side and uh, see who else is going to pipe in. And then uh, I'll, I'd like to talk about design jams today because that's something we're getting pumped up about <clears throat> as far as the team goes. We're going to start getting heavy into design jams related to the open source everything store. Uh, here's another word for anyone who understands. This. Does anyone understand um, open source Earth catalog? What's that an allusion to? <laughs> so Jennifer gets it, right? Tell us. Earth catalog, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and when you talk to younger people, they don't they don't know that because they did up with the whole Earth catalog. Who else on the team has uh, heard or made that? <clears throat> reference when I said that. Did anyone else pick that up? I haven't heard that though, Chris. But I'm not too familiar with Okay. Well, I think that's um, uh, making an allusion the open source Earth Catalog. That might be a good way to reframe the concept of the open source everything store. So different ways to, to look at it. But there is a rich history of the so-called the hippie movement. Okay, say okay. Let's let's go into history. World War Two. We're scared about communism and fascism after the war. Uh, we've got military-industrial complex popping up in the 40s, 50s. Then the hippie movement in the 70s. Earth, whole Earth catalog. People got it disenchanted that failed, and now we've got this um, Silicon Valley utopianism and things like that. But I don't think the open source message has penetrated far out in, in the greater dialogue of, of humanity at this point. And I say this, I've been reading some very good books on the topic. One is called uh, called The Democratic Surround. And the other one is called From, Cyber Cult From Counterculture to Cyberculture. So it kind of tries to portray the whole story of how uh, the progressive movements in America and, and democratic thinking came about. But the thing that's always missing for, for me in that whole meta story is the, is the story of open source, of true collaboration, open sharing. Because people kind of talk about it, but... Even if you look at people like Buckminster Fuller, you know, he patented all his stuff. I don't know that if he died patenting stuff, but I know at least initially he start he's patenting stuff and he was, you know, and all those people in, uh, in the books we read about, um, on one, one side say that, oh, yeah, we should share, but on the other side, I don't think any of them took open source as a, as a core out of the culture. That's a little aside, but let's get into the meeting. Uh, so, so I, I'd like to start with the version program intro and then some more details a uh, little bit of update on the shredder as far as the immersion program so we got a last flurry of applicants so we've got 14 people total that have applied i'm actually sending out letters currently offer letters to three people uh still still uh waiting to select or, or have more interviews with others for a total of four now there's going to be uh we're going to have room for five people in the sense that one of the people a woman from India, she's actually not going to stick around with the fellowship program. She's going to go to India to try to take some of that work with the plastic shredder and recycler and 3D printers to India. But that's pretty good to, to see a decent number of people showing up to interview. And so at least we can have some people to select from. That's really good. I'm excited about we're, we're at a phase where we're, we can scale finally after all this time. Um, in principle, we have a scalable way to bootstrap the project, and that is through full-time people. Uh, it's worked for us as a small team here on site, but now we're spreading that to multiple locations around the U.S. And then, of course, the next step, probably next year, would be to spread that to multiple locations around the world. So we might open up the next fellowship uh, with international audiences in mind. So that's definitely awesome. The goal is, humbly speaking, to double the operation every year for the next decade until we get to about 1,000 full-time people project, at which point we're... I'm really at the scale of a Linux type operation. So that's that would be the ideal situation. So good news on a immersion program. Actually tomorrow uh, midnight is the official deadline uh, for, for applications and we're sending out all the offers and, and acceptances by the 10th um, so that we, we know who's with us. And right now I'm producing parts for the boot camp. So if you look at um, Slide number five, that's that's production. There's parts for about 14 printers there. <clears throat> and above there, you see the latest iteration of the 3D. Uh, zooming around, as I mentioned last week, we were uh, 
optimizing for speed so so getting it up to 400 percent of normal speed like normal speed might be 50 millimeters per second that's like what we ran last year and this time we are blading fast and there's some some little details have to be addressed in order to make it happen um, you see the picture on the bottom there it's kind of blurry that's because that thing is moving so fast we can hardly stand it that's good so producing parts the the one one thing that i run into is actually at the high speed what happens is the rods that we use are starting to get scratched up and i've never seen that i was like what's going on here because at some point i had a couple of prints fell and then i examined the rods and they were actually getting scratched because just too fast and there's too much wear on the rods so uh what what i'm doing right now is ex experimenting with an option where we have one rod on each axis that is the eight millimeter proper size chrome rod and the rest are the 5 16th rods also hardened steel uh, but the idea there is when i used all the rods at the eight millimeter uh, size there's more resistance and therefore you cannot go as fast because if you have absolutely zero play in the whole system you have to be down to like 1,000th or whatever, super precise on the structure itself in order to have no friction on all the axes. Because, for example, on the y-axis, we have two, two y-axes, so they're not exactly parallel. You're going to start having a hard time moving the axis if the, if the axes are not parallel. You're going to be diverging, and it's going to put a lot of stress on the bearings, and the rods are going to bend and stuff. So uh, you need high precision at that point. So one way to address it is to use the 8 millimeter one 8 millimeter rod for the y-axis, x-axis, z-axis, and other ones are, are 5 16 so there's a little bit of play while allowing the full accuracy to come from that single 8 millimeter rod. So that's just an idea I'm playing with here, and I'm going to see if I can get back up to 400 or even 500%. Uh, ideally, it will go up to 500 where you can actually print very high quality, uh, without the thing failing after some time. So I, I did some printing on a 400% speed, but then just a little bit, and pretty quickly the rod started getting marred up. Uh, so that's the report on that. Uh, next report is on the plastic shredder, so you can see some of the pictures of the actual build there. Uh, so I, I ordered the parts they are actually arriving today, uh, the, the formal parts, which are, as you see in the upper left picture there. <clears throat> now what is it? Why am I... It's giving me view only again. No, there it is. There it is. Okay. Um, if you take a look at uh, slide number six, let me share my screen there. So everybody can take a look at that. Okay, so uh, if you see up here, that's that's the cat of the precious plastic shredder. That's for real. That's the parts we've gotten so on the wiki. We have a uh, I download CAD for that or a link to it. There's a metric version that issued with the original version is that it's millimeter sizes, and you can't get five, three, five, six millimeter steel in America. I tried, but then we went to one eighth, which is close to three millimeters. <clears throat> A quarter inch, which is close to six millimeters, and three sixteenths, which is close to five millimeters. So that's the version for America. Also, including hex rod that's one inch, not some twenty-seven millimeter rod. For some reason, they got twenty-seven millimeter rod that they use for the uh, official European version, which naturally Ruslan likes. But here, uh, I also did what we see here for the build on the. This is on OSC Workshop's Facebook page. If you scroll down a few, few deals, the, the rotor that I did is a simple, simplified one just to experiment side by side whether that thing actually works. Because if it does, it's just um, parts that are cut by a, an abrasive metal cutoff. So you don't need a, any CNC. Uh, looks good so far. I mean, it's, it's pretty decent. Um, you can see the knife pieces, which are simply triangular, like on angle cut pieces. And how do you cut a 45 degree exactly on a on a on a abrasive cutoff 
you notch, make a little notch, and then you set it in that little slot there, it turns out that it fits exactly so you can actually cut it. So it's just by accident you can cut it at 45 degrees without a problem like that. Otherwise it's pretty much impossible because you can't really cut on a flat surface, you gotta cut it on edge. Uh, if you cut it on a flat surface it pretty much takes forever and a lot of times it actually hardens the seal before cutting it so you cannot cut it at all actually because the, the metal, the heat and blade go against the steel if it's not cutting fast enough it will harden the steel then you actually cannot go through the steel at all uh, but fortunately you can you can do this in this case so you can use a an abrasive cut off to do this that's my report so um oh yeah ne next week so in a shredder the sorry the filament maker looking forward to it we're going to be building three totals so it looks like dr pierce's group uh, at michigan tech university is going to be handling two two bills and i'll be doing another build but yeah we've got all parts uh cool thing about the the filament maker the uh, the one from michigan tech the recycle about it's got 3d printed belts and pulleys um like the belt is printed out of rubber so i'm printing that too which give me ideas for also for the 3d printer it may be possible for low brow low cost version if we can actually optimize that and develop it we can likely print our own belts and pulleys for the the 3d printer it would require some engineering because off the shelf that uh, you need some precision there uh, it's not just something you just hit print, you have, you're going to have to refine that, but I think it's going to be quite possible to get even down to the 10 micron resolution, the standard 10 micron resolution, even with three printed belts and pulleys. That's actually good news. I was thinking about a low brow version of the 3D, which could be uh, 3D printed corners and even 3D printed tubing, so that uh, all the parts, as many as possible, are 3D printed, at which point I went through some initial numbers, and I think we can probably get the price down of a of a brute force low brow like ent super entry level no heated bed um print pla pretty much uh, 175 dollars for parts i think if we go back to a little bit of technical recursion of making our own parts for that including the frames and sprockets and belts that are 3d printed so very interesting things um, the the extruder that we use right now, which is the Prusai 3MK2, is 3D printed. It's actually a very nice deal on page 5 there. Um, the 3D printed parts work really well. It's, it's a nicely engineered design. It's working well without a problem. And it takes the only custom parts in there is basically hot end, the, the heat sink, and a couple of springs and bolts. But beyond that, it's, it's 3D printed and, and a couple of fans but very low cost um i mean the heat sink if you buy it from parts it costs about ten dollars so that's pretty good i'm gonna actually try to to run that, that filament that it uses there is 1.75 millimeter so it's designed for that but i don't see why that the motor that we have in extra right now would not be able to handle three millimeter filament and i was looking into that why Prusa is not using that they they did use three millimeter filament initially but I think for the purposes of size, like, you know, it's harder to push 3 millimeter film. I think for size issues and for ease of melt, because it's easier to melt 1.75 millimeter than 3 millimeter. Therefore, the extruder can be lighter. Um, but I think that's the only reason. I don't think it's that the 3 millimeter wouldn't work. I think it's there going with this pretty much hobbyist version, which does not consider industrial applications such as print, printing, 3D printing, uh, plastic lumber or such which we do want to do so we definitely want three millimeter filament and even bigger filament for printing large objects that's all i got people does anyone else want to speak because i've got i've got some other things about design gems that i could talk about but um by the way they're the people who are <clears throat> applying for the immersion program they are also going to be joining the, the dev team so we should be expecting a few more people popping up into the into the meetings and there's a, also another person I'm actually in, uh, meeting with after the meeting uh, so there's, a, there's actually uh, three new developers that i haven't mentioned but they are they have already passed the free ad test so i'm going to bring them on board uh, as soon as we can here who would like to go next Hey, why don't you tell us a little bit about PowerCube? Yeah. 
Let's look up your blog. Uh, by the way, one more comment uh, about the immersion. Just for reference, out of the 15 pe 14 people, four of them <coughs> were former current developers, actually, which is interesting uh, because we're seeing an interesting on-road, on-roading, uh, onboard, <laughs> onboarding roadmap here where people from the dev team are, are people who are most interested in the immersion program. So that's, that's really good that the dev team could be a stepping stone towards the deeper immersion. That's just an aside. Okay, Abe, take it away. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, I got a little bit more done on the plumbing on the power cube. I just had a few more plumbing parts and some minor adjustments in trying to keep the the color code plumbing straight and kind of cleaning up that file uh, that would be the main complete uh, file with the, the assembled simple parts, <clears throat> which I think are all updated and correct now. So I've gotten the, I think the frame and everything, it's just plumbing now. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I probably have to learn a little bit more uh, technique with uh, FreeCAD and maybe some of the drafting abilities for trying to draw some uh, more plumbing parts or hoses and things like that. Some trouble with that. Well, that would be, um, that'd be the thing the war bench, right? Yeah, and I've used that for some things. It, it does have some, uh, well, let's see, external certain aspects of, uh, let's see, the pipe or AOC pipe or I think some of it has some bugs in Forget 16, but um, <clears throat> some of those parts, I've been using them and then modifying some of that for just simple small plumbing parts and uh, the making some stuff based off of those, but a bunch of that are a little before I dry hand, but um, yeah, the Flamingo workbench I'm getting a little more, more used to, but um, I'll have to figure out how it runs the pipes if it's not the right. I, I don't know how, I know it does like static pipes uh, that are probably like solid plumbing. I don't know how to do hoses, but uh, I'll have to look at that closer. So I was going to draw more of them in. Some draft uh, curves and so on. Just estimate some of that. But um, I've also got to still got to propagate some of the changes to the frame and so on to the uh, smaller cube. And then uh, once that's all update updated, maybe some of the plumbing can be estimated a little more with some kind of assembly onto the uh, the large tractor. Uh, because it kind of has, all has to go together. Uh, and I guess that's probably eventually here going to involve um, looking at the large tractor again more pretty soon because that, all that plumbing kind of has to be based around how it, it's all going to fit together on there. Uh -huh. So that's probably the difficult part, but... Um, I think I got some other fittings to put together on it. I've got fitting in the pump and everything now, but um, a few more parts. I'm hoping the, uh, I think all the fittings are there in a way that, that looks good and is functional space wise, but um, you know, some of those could be shorter or longer if necessary, but um, I think the ones that the hoses clamp on, they probably need to be a little bit longer. Um, can we see you put two or the like double or large clamps to clamp those hoses on that are, let's see, I need to look at, I need to look at what those clamps look like. They're, um, they're different from like standard like house clamps, right? Yeah, they're, uh, they should be in a bill of materials, I believe. Okay. They're, they're similar, but they're kind of like heavy duty ones. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I remember those. Uh, on the list. Yeah, so they might be a little bigger, but yeah, I think there's enough. It's like an inner show of space there to clamp onto, so it should be pretty good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I got a few more tails, bolts, and uh, stuff to add, I guess, mm -hmm. to the overall assembly, but so it's getting, getting closer. Um, I think there's plenty of space on everything. I looked at that, and, and even if stuff moves around a little bit, there's there's room to it for adjustment. How do we, uh, Abe, how do you, what's, so I was thinking about, okay, so we've got this kind of a, 
design how do we verify it how do we go from you know you know say we go up to the build and we find oh now now this part's not fitting or this is not fitting because things are different what are your thoughts on how we can do that how we can verify that this this is all going to work yeah i mean hopefully the measurements on some things are accurate enough but yeah some of these parts could still be a little bit smaller or bigger um i guess that could be the case on certain parts but i mean obviously the main frame and everything i think the engine's pretty accurate and yeah i mean there should be some room for you know some of these parts are made and cut and welded together so there's got to be enough room for you know at least a 16th uh, order is here and there yeah um yeah i mean you could try doing the model printing stuff like you talked about before i hear it maybe either though and then it scales because um, yeah, I mean, uh, oh, that reminds me of something I had to talk about. It was, uh, I noticed, I think I saw somewhere in a day some, some stuff about whole map and the open source photogrammetry stuff again. And, yeah. Um, looked at some of it a little bit. I don't think I, I don't think I got around installing all that stuff for because I, I didn't get that whole channel. And there was, then it was, I don't know how easy that is. It looks like another, uh, a broad kind of multiple. So you have to go through and figure out how to use to to be able to do that. Um, I don't know if there's any easy way that's that's really open source. I, there might be. I think I saw that there's some. It might be partly open source. I'm, I'm not sure, but there's something called I think VR works for Android because mm -hmm. these phones. But I, I I think it's based on Google, so it it uses their servers or something. But they have some kind of framework that they've designed and released, and I'm thinking it was open source but i think it was called vr works for android but it can you know take photos and just measure things mm -hmm. um it, you kind of set it on your phone and there's accuracy issues but i'm thinking if you set it up right you know that that would be a great thing to have um uh, in some ways th there should be simpler ways to to do that photo uh so if you think if you put a ruler or some known size of thing and take a photo there should be some software that can look at it easily and okay give well i mean for example we have a bunch of pictures from the engine you think we can try apply that to that you, you know the, what i'm talking about right? we have a bunch of images yeah there's a, tape, there's a tape measure in there yeah. and to be visible i got the impression from what i read about that vr which they actually the, the tape thing was that it, if it takes photos or just video it sounds like it, some of that could be open source, but I'm sure that's kind of relying on Google's impression because it's mm -hmm. probably heavily processed by some sort of deep machine learning, deep net stuff. But um, it looks like they, they at least have some kind of open source framework for that. But um, I don't know how to process. How are we going to input the images? The images with the tape and everything, I think I have those pretty accurate just looking at it and not. But, um, it, it'd be good to try to take the photos and, and work something out like that. But I think even for whole map and uh, another tool chain was the idea was you, you kind of yeah. needed to set it up there too and take photos more carefully. So I don't know, yeah. it, there's probably a variety of tools for that. The image processing stuff, uh, looking at a lot of machine learning, things like that is, is pretty popular. So there's there's definitely a bunch of open source tools out there, I'm sure, for all this stuff and um how easy they are to use i guess is one issue but right you can usually develop a way to do it but um and it, and maybe the standards for taking the photos to begin with yeah um, right we have to develop that now uh let me ask you this do you have any other parts that currently go into the power cube at at your place that you can try a call map tool chain or something like that and, and get a sample scan so we can start working with those tool chains like the valve, for example, uh, like a ball valve. Uh, yeah, I might have some, some ball valves on. Yeah, I think I've got some point parts and stuff like that. Uh, that would be good. Is that three quarter? Uh, test. test. Um, yeah, yeah, I think those in there are three quarter. Um, there's supposed to be some one in there. Uh, I think they're all. Yeah, I think those are three. You'd have one of those engines, yeah. would you? The An engine? Yeah. Not, not like that. I don't think so. 
Um, I have a lot of small engines to turn. But... Yeah. But it would be good yeah, to I... see it. Do you want to try maybe as your next step is to, to try a reverse engineering or a 3D scan of a ball valve to see what whether, you know, what kind of issues we run into? Yeah, yeah, I think that the photogrammetry stuff is kind of kind of important. Um, I think the timeline on it, because, yeah, I had to put things like that just kind of on the list of what I thought was important to do next. Um, yeah, I mean, look into the combat stuff next. That might help um, verify and then look to get the plumbing things done. To put the video stuff would, uh, or imaging would simplify. I mean, I, I say video because it seems like video is just a series of pictures and if you process that right it you know it should be easy to do with um any modern smartphone but <clears throat> there's different ways to be done um so yeah what's what's easier hmm. yeah i'll have to look through that tool chain and find some some parts to experiment with on that then all right, well, I think that's mostly it on the power cube. Um, okay. Else? It sounds like um, we've got more people interested in that, uh, in, the, in the different workshops coming up in the fellowship and all that. I, I tried to spread some flyers and things around for that, but oh, yeah. lots of that, some, just, I mean, just, you know, the flyer that's there on the website. Uh, I wanted to get it to a uh, maker space, but I, I was in a town when I found that, so... Yeah, actually, um, thanks a but, lot. There's uh, one guy who apparently responded to that. They said that I, someone left a fly, Abe left a fire on my desk. Who was that? Well, that, that was actually probably with my dad when I was in town. I probably left the flies in the, in the printer. Um, uh -huh. There, yeah, my dad is actually the one who... who let it open source code before I because he discovered your tractor some years back. Uh huh. Uh, protocol and things like that. And he likes listening to, uh, he, he does kind of catch up once in a while on some of the, the videos and things online. Uh, some of your speeches and on and he likes, uh, listen to some of that and see in some of the machines. But yeah, he, he used to build some, uh, uh, equipment. He used to do tree planting. So he says he's not a very good welder, but he, he has, some skills. I know. I don't think he had other people do all that stuff for him. He built some tree planting machines and sold them all one time. Yeah. Thank so you. he has some interest. He'll probably. Uh, I think he was contacting some people about it. So. Yeah. We'll see. Sounds like he passed this on to somebody else because this was. Uh, it wasn't an Anderson that, whoever emailed me about that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds good. So, um, what else we got? Uh, so, Abe, see if, yeah, I mean, if you get, uh, continue on your work and then see if you can introduce some minor experiments on photogrammetry into that. We have to get into that more. Okay. Now, uh, anyone else would like to share? We got Eric. Anything from Eric? Hi. Can you guys hear me? Uh, so, I was out of the town last week, camping out there now. Um, uh, so I'm just getting back into, um, uh, some stuff now, um, we'll be working on the CNC sort of getting together, uh, supplies, and, um, looking yeah. for, uh, workspace to use. Um, and then I've been negotiating a little bit with my university to, uh, to open source some of my work. Um, mm -hmm. so that's, uh, in progress. And then, um, I'll uh, be able to share that when that goes through. And which which work is that? Uh, some genetic engineering tools. Okay. 
Yeah. Is that you had some conversations? What was was like? Uh, was tell us about that experience. What was the conversation like? Uh, well, this process has been going on for about a year. Um, originally, uh, I wasn't going for uh, open source per se. Um, I just needed a way to um, distribute some of our uh, materials. Uh, and our uh, tech transfer office um, delayed things and is uh, you know, trying to insert themselves in the process. Mm -hmm. So, um, most of it will be available, though it wouldn't uh, be under an open source license, it would be under kind of a conventional license, um, but it would be available through a third party, which uh, would make it uh, pretty easy for uh, researchers to get hold of it. Um, but because of um, all of the issues going back and forth, um, I presented them a proposal to uh, release just one, one of the tools, a uh, basic tool, as um, under an open source uh, license. Um, it's actually looking at the open MTA. MTA is a material transfer agreement. Um, and this open MTA was developed by uh, Cambridge uh -huh. uh, as part of the open plan project. Um, so I, I can um, put them on the manifold on Wiki um, under my uh, web syntax biology page. Um, so uh, I, I will uh, update that, um, the generalities, and then um, for my specific situation, once we've actually um, come to a conclusion with that, I'll uh, be happy to promote that any way I can. Huh. Does this have anything to do with OpenMTA? Does Dr. Pierce from Michigan Tech have anything to do with that? Do you know? Cause he's uh, no, I don't think he's uh, involved in that. Uh, it's mainly for biological materials. Yeah. So uh, biological materials have, um, I know the feature of being able to self-replicate, um, though they uh, are covered. Sounds like you cut out, Eric. Are you? Uh... Hello, here. Okay, now now you're back. Okay. Um. So, uh, the uh, biological material when you distribute it to um someone, they have the option of basically replicating it um as much as they want. Um, a lot of times things are sent um between people without a MTA, without any sort of agreement, which I prefer to do, um, but the universities, uh, that's not technically allowed. So, um, yeah, we need to figure out how to deal with that in, uh, with all the new technologies. Yeah. Yeah, I see on this open MTA, I see like open plant. Talking about open plants, I'd like to see some open nuts, some hazelnuts and chestnuts. That's what I'd like to see. Okay. Um, uh, yeah? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think biological materials um, are just inherently uh, kind of open, but yeah, we need to figure out the framework to. Right, to except, that. you know, it's funny, like, for example, we have Stark Brothers, but, you know, like, we grow a lot of fruit trees here, but a lot of that is proprietary material. Like, for example, Stark Brothers, uh, we buy plants from there, but they're like, oh, you can't propagate it, sucker. <laughs> like, the, you know, they, they have patents on those things, which is pretty uh, obnoxious, pretty insane in our world. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the reality. But, I mean, the idea is, yeah, like, we, that's we got to have effort to keep things open source, to develop, you know, say here we're developing the hazelnuts, chestnuts, actually that's going to be open source, uh, so that you know, we publish and distribute that so that nobody can suck up, but um, someone has to do that work, otherwise enclosure uh, can keep happening if that's not in public consciousness. So, 
Yeah, we can definitely talk about um, the options to make sure that uh, stuff developed uh, OSC, um, any sort of agricultural stuff can stay open source. Yeah, so you want these not to remain open. That's all I got to <laughs> say. Okay. Um, excellent. Anyone else piping in? Uh, we've got a couple more people. Any news that are noteworthy? No. Okay. Well, uh, I can speak a little bit more than if nobody's typing here. Uh, so, I'd like to introduce the idea of what part of the work that we're going to be doing with the once, once we get the people on board here. So there's the training in, in September, but then what happens afterwards? So there will be three main areas of endeavor, and that is one is running workshops, two which is 25% of the time. And the rest of it is largely research and development work, continuing on product development of everything, including the social technology, which which exists in the form of the extreme manufacturing workshops, the swarm builds, as well as your design jams. How do we democratize product design? So just like at some point, for example, democracy came in as a, as a favorable system of governance, I believe in the future we will have um, democratic design as just a natural default, as a desirable state of how you do, how you create products and innovate. So that said, we can uh, put a dent in it right now, the open source my factory. So when our fellows get trained, part of the work we, we'll do is every month we do a, a design jam, which is uh, both a design and prototyping event. So imagine our fellows have their several machines. In fact, it's seven, it's 3D printers, CNC circuit mill, laser cutter, filament maker, and shredder for plastic. And we host an event where in parallel in the multiple locations throughout the state, so it's probably five locations. At the very beginning, when we hold that monthly, we will uh, do that event in parallel, have the capacity to do do design work using CAD tools and then prototyping work using the, the prototyping tools of the open source desk micro factory. And that's a way that we can insert ourselves into the public consciousness. This would be open to the public, but it also um, introduces the need for simple to use accessible techniques. That's why you see me like in the development team talk a lot about accessible tool chains like in FreeCAD, for example, uh, I still say we use a super basic merge mechanism, forget about the constraints, uh, just use us a mechanism that will allow a novice to, with at entry level, to join that process with an hour, for example, an hour of learning. Part of the immersion is going to be to develop that kind of training where after one hour, you can have anybody start with sketches, extrude them, process them, modify them and be able to make complex parts. I believe that can pretty much be taught in an hour, uh, pending, of course, good guidance on that. And I've seen that in workshops before, where uh, when I taught pre-CAD, people were able to do the sketches, extrude them, and modify them, doing further sketch on the different faces, which that work workflow right there can get you to a lot of different three-dimensional objects, just a lot of stuff. And, and especially if you treat design in a very modular way and then break down the the workflow among many people you can get to pretty complex designs in rapid time so say we we design like uh so what are some possible candidates for design jams we have a page on the wiki called let's see what's it called something it's not, let's see, is it design jams? Um, product candidates for a design jam. It could be, okay, whatever that page is. It could be something like a pen. Okay, well, a 3D printed pen. Writing utensils are in themselves like a billion dollar market, right? So you can think about producing them in a distributed way. And of course, not competing with, uh, you know, big, big pens, which are throwaway, but, but competing on other facets like okay this pen is something you can keep forever or you can make it yourself therefore with the ikea effect you you built it so you own it so you like it 
Um, and of course, into that, introducing the whole notion of recycling. I say that your pen breaks, you can recycle and therefore have closed loop material cycles with an environmental angle. So a pen is a very simple example, you know, design an excellent pen. You can put that on a website, sell it, or give away a swag like OSE pens or something. And then you can be talking about everything else. A shop vac vacuum cleaner with a bunch of 3D printed plastic plus a motor and some maybe a rubber tube for the, the big tube and the all the things is a plastic in there so that's another example or, or cell phones or anything else so but in order to for that to be feasible with um with a group of people in parallel who don't have a lot of experience in design we would have to take advantage of our of seating part library so to the event you would bring knowledge uh, starting with a breakdown of some kind of a machine like pen or a vacuum cleaner or a cordless drill right so you break it down into all the parts using the modular design concept break it down to modules and then you can say take the modules and break them down further so for example you have a battery pack as a module well the battery pack is going to have the case it's going to have the batteries it's going to have the connection it might have like a led indicator light to show the state of charge, so maybe you have a little circuit, uh, a CNC circuit node circuit in there. But once again, from the module, you can go down to sub modules and therefore say divide this drill into 50 or 100 parts. And therefore, for each of the parts, of course, the main asset is okay, here's the concept design of how that should go look, but then you get people on CAD to actually render out the technical detail and that can be done in parallel so imagine that that's that's in one location sam running that in kansas city well we've got four other fellows in california washington state chicago and texas or such and then we've got that kind of design work happening in parallel we could be be posting those results in a real life stream like say facebook or other method which is social media applied to technical development uh, we'd be collaborating sharing best ideas maybe check in with each other uh, say at lunchtime say okay what's the maybe some group came up with a killer idea an excellent idea oh here's how you do the super battery you know to make it really easy to replace little batteries in there and things like that uh, so it could be a lot of cross fertilization happening and if you do that as a public event it would also be interesting to get the incentive challenge concept going with that so it could be turned into competition such as like hero x i mentioned before right we can spawn a hero x campaign on top of that and maybe collect funds through crowdfunding to fund a prize and then you'd have to have clear judging criteria for what a winning entry is and all this starts with a clear product definition so exactly what is it that you're designing what are the parameters and we can restrict that quite a bit to a what i would call a degenerate workflow degenerate meaning that um you provide so much information people are led down certain paths of development and not like everyone's doing the same thing they're they're still innovating but within a framework that gives them enough guidance for example, things like part libraries, like if you're designing around this universal battery pack system, you use one of those, um, whatever they are, it's not AA batteries, but those slightly larger ones for the battery pack, let's say. Okay, so you would provide the CAD for that battery. You might provide CAD for other standard elements, like for example, the Open Circuit Institute has a library of acceptable parts, admissible parts that they always use. Like here's your standard header or here's your standard circuit board size or whatever whatever standard are imposed from other um other channels that help you along with the design so therefore you could be working on the mechanical aspect you can be working on the electrical aspects and then producing that from 3d printing laser cutting cnc milling uh, there could be other roles during this event where the people are uh, you know, for lunchtime, people went to lunch, they save their plastic, and we grind that in the filament shredder and make plastic soap. So making the actual filament with which we build this thing is part of the workshop. 
before we go dumpster diving <laughs> at lunch and, and get some scrap ABS bumpers from uh, down the street and grind that down to, to the actual ABS plastic that we use to, to make the case of, say, the cordless drill. Uh, what, what we will be doing during the immersion program is developing the techniques for how we get a large number of people to collaborate like that. How do you do the collaboration architecture? What are all the roles? What are all the people doing? And then you have to have the, the procedures for each of the development steps, just like we have with uh, sort of seated in the development template. So building upon all the past work that we've done, we can make this happen to the point that this becomes a viable way to develop products and it's, it's something we can do right now today for uh for the public in the public using open source tools and everything that we generate of course is naturally open product design and the notion there is if you develop a product that is fully open source and it's actually high quality we take it even up to a web embeddable codes for say you want to put this on your website then you have the graphics assets and some marketing assets that you can literally cut and cut and paste and embed codes say you want to build and sell these three printed pens as a little sideline business to your friends or something you have it. all those assets up to the enterprise assets um, marketing assets and you know website materials like embed codes we would generate all that in the immersion program, we will uh, develop these techniques and also uh, run a real design jam on the actually the very last of the. If you look at the schedule for the immersion program, the last day is a two-day design jam, where the first day is basically the extreme manufacturing workshop, where we build a bunch of machines like 3D printer. We'll be we'll be building 3D printers the first day. Second day, we'll be using them and bringing other tools to do the design jam where you design and build and prototype. So that's um, that's the kind of framework we're trying to establish and scale. Uh, but I must emphasize that this does rely on low entry barriers. And when you ask somebody, okay, participate in that, well, you have to take a little basic course, basic course in FreeCAD. And I wanna get to the point where in about an hour exercise video, we can get people to use FreeCAD reliably for very simple things that are sufficient to build people's skills so that people can jump off into more complex tasks from there. Uh, right now we have two of the short five minute videos on FreeCAD, that, the, the ones that I did that I think are super condensed. We could do another one that is just much more focused on, this is the single video that you need to get started. Along with that, we would have to have OSC Linux because we want to avoid all kinds of issues with people's computer systems. To give you an example of why another example which we ran into recently on OSC Linux is Michael was doing the building the, the extruder for the 3D printer and on his version of the computer, he was not using OSC Linux. There was one little nut catcher that just wouldn't show up in CAD. And then I printed that, uh, the, printed the STL of that the nut catcher was not there and the part was simply wrong and then I went back and forth and we tracked it down that for some reason his version of FreeCAD was not rendering this single nut catcher for a small nut in one of the parts. So that's once again the reason why I want everybody using OSC Linux because there could be bugs and different differences based on operating systems. And this year happened on both Linux systems. He had a Linux install he was running free and independently on that, and I, I used the Ubuntu 16.04 of the OSC Linux. And uh, even on both Linux versions, the the file did not show up the same on the two different systems. We went back and forth to verify that that indeed did happen. It, the file was just not rendering the same on two different computers. Uh, and I, I haven't seen that kind of difference happen when both computers are the OSC Linux. So we're saying pretty much if you use OSC Linux, we guarantee that everything's going to be identical. You're not going to run into little quirks which can derail an operation such as your design jam where you're on a time schedule. You know, you've got a day, say, to design something. You don't want to be spending half your time trying to make computers work. So uh, that's, that's the reason we're, uh, for OSC Linux and the usage of common open source tools that have to be available. And also 
uh, easy to access, lowering the barriers to entry for anyone to do this. So uh, that's kind of a brief overview on, on the design jams, but we really look forward to that because we've done the first design jam that was like, what was that, like 2013, we were looking at documentation standards, a bunch of people showed up. It was a cool event, very nice event that was in New York City. Uh, that was called the Open Source Hardware Documentation Jam. And we got some result out of that, but mostly meeting people and having a pretty decent time and, and learning things uh, while being productive. So I do believe in that that kind of social technology being the common that the common norm that people learn. People learn how to collaborate in massive ways that are more than just watching football games or watching sports events or rock concerts. I think you can also develop a parallel culture where people there could be thousands of people that are getting together for very productive ends, which if that is well developed, that could be the replacement for insurance or, or other mechanisms that we can use. Like for example, with the alternative open source insurance um, at OC, our insurance policy is going to be, yeah, it's the OSC insurance policy. It says that if a house burned down, next day we'll send 200 people and you're going to get a new house in three days. You know, that's that's a cool kind of insurance. It wouldn't cost you anything. It would, it would mean basically it's part of a network or a community. But the thing that has to happen is, is people learning those skills and that collaborative literacy, the idea that it's better to work together and et cetera. And I think some of the kind of uh, concepts we can start dressing with these design gems that we're, we're literally generating a large, uh, productive, literate public that can now tackle um, various global grand challenges that you know, productive people are good people, people that know how to do things or be practical in life is, is definitely a, a good addition to a democratic society. That's kind of the greater picture there. Uh, but that's kind of my two cents on the design gems. I just wanted to bring that up and it's a, it's a very important thing that we will be doing uh, on top of the research and development work, but for which reason I also emphasize again that we really want to focus not specialized skill set, but on generalist skill sets where all of us can talk to one another. At LC, we always say it's the it's the, the grand picture, the generalism, the ecology aspect means the integration of many different disciplines to a working whole. Because in a world of specialization today, if one person does not understand anything about other aspects of the world, it's very difficult for the person to make rational choices. In, in a, in a, towards the whole welfare of society. So the more people are well-rounded, the better, the better it is for a democratic surround. So um, that's that. Any questions or comments or suggestions on the design jam concept? I don't own this IGM concept, but I like it when you start talking about like the basic principles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to connect, you know, you work on technology, but it's not, it's not really technology that's the ultimate aim. I think it's about creating better people. So the social technology definitely has to be addressed right now for a reason. Also during the immersion, we're saying that five hours of our work every week should go to personal development like learning about how to be a better human or how to gain other skills and areas that are totally different than your discipline of specialization because we're trying to cultivate more well-rounded people right yeah wouldn't that be nice it would help but you know me i can talk to anybody about anything <laughs> <laughs> all right well you're ahead of the game maybe I don't know. I haven't. I have to figure out how to make that into a. Uh, oh, not monetize it, but some form of support. Right, Jen. I'm you gotta monetize it. it. Just monetize it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I see what you're saying. It's uh. Well, it's it's hard to be anti to be anti fiat and anti establishment money system, which that slavery system. And then think of that, about how to monetize stuff, and that's where I keep right. beating the wall. But I'm, I'm like at this incredible, just shouting point right here, and 
And by I'm making the meetings, like the idea is like, you keep talking about open source microfactory. I'm like, wait a minute, there's no bottle bill in Washington. I could be getting these bottles and shredding them and, exactly. and making them. You know, and they're just like, and that guy's an eating plot. It's all right here, but I'm working too much. I'm just like, I'm just putting a big stop on that, man. I'm just going to be a poor right. You've got the <laughs> filament maker guy right next door to you there, right? Right. And he's, right. he's actually shipping that filament maker probably like this week or not, probably like this week to us so we're going to have both for the immersion to experiment with yeah okay i know i need to draw that i need to draw that 3d printer for i'm just going to draw the 3d printer frame um that i was trying to explain to you before about a slight adjustment size because that will make it more stable when you put it together it'll make it so that they go together more consistently too so that's like my number one thing to do today is to draw what I was talking about so you can see how it will make the frame more stable. Okay. Because frame stability is important at the at the high speeds. Remember we were talking about the plastic PVC version of the printer. And the answer to that right. is I think I think we're pretty sure, yes, absolutely that will work. However, the question is gonna be at what performance level? how fast we'll be able to move that before the things start shaking and you get inaccurate prints. So we can right. definitely do a, a lowbrow version any day with the PVC frame, but when it comes to getting high performance out of it, that will require some engineering, some good engineering, to make sure we understand all the little details that matter. And that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, I've seen PVC used for a lot of things it doesn't really work for in the long run. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to get going. So I've got, um, actually talking to another developer right now. So, so we'll reconvene next year, next year, next week, next week at 2 p well, 2 p sorry guys, actually 2 p.m. next week. I'm going to be in, um, this will be Mission Tech University. So I can't really make the meeting. I'll be building the 3D printer, not the 3D printer, the shredder, but sorry, the filament maker at the time. So actually next week, I can't really have the meeting. We're, we're doing the, the build pretty much Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I think we have to reconvene in two weeks from now uh, for the next meeting. So we'll see you in two weeks all. All right. Thanks, everybody.